If you're going to be turning 65 in the next 10 years or so, you might want to listen to this. Seven out of 10 of us are going to need long-term care. Think nursing home. Kind of shocking, right? Do you want to avoid that fate? Did you even know that you could? Stick around for the next few minutes. I think you might be surprised at what you learn. Hey there, my name is Kelly, and if you haven't done it already, check out my bio and intro, intro video pinned up here at the top. As I state in all my videos, my goal with this channel is to be an advocate for you. Hopefully, I'll be able to educate you regarding diet and lifestyle related topics so that you can be a more informed consumer of health care. But I have to add a disclaimer here. I'm not a doctor. You should always consult one before making changes that might impact your health. What I am is a health advocate, a researcher, and a certified educator of health and wellness topics. Everything that I mention here today is fully referenced in the blog post on my website and also in my free ebook called Healthy at Home. I'll make sure to put a link down below so that you can get your copy and check out those references. All right, so today's topic is staying healthy at home and avoiding the nursing home. I don't know about you, but I want to stay healthy and I want to live longer, but I want to have the option to live out my final years at home in a healthy way. If you're a baby boomer, if you're one of the over 50 Gen Xers like I am, you might want to pay extra close attention. If nothing else, I'm confident that you're going to learn something today that you didn't already know. It is estimated right now that 10,000 baby boomers are turning 65 every single day. According to the Administration for Community Living, people who live to be 65 have a 70% chance of requiring long-term care in their remaining lifetime. Isn't that insane? Over the next 25 years, the U U.S. will have more seniors than ever before who will need some sort of long-term care. The odds are that you and I are going to be one of those seniors, 7 out of 10, right? So before I get too far into this, I want to make sure that we're all on the same page with something, how we define long-term care. It's a pretty broad term, but it's used to describe a laundry list of services that are provided to seniors who can no longer do for themselves. Most of that care is provided in assisted living facilities or nursing homes, and the lucky ones are able to have some of that care at home with either a home health aide or family members who have the time, or maybe the training. The reality is that most people don't have those resources and they end up in a nursing facility. More than likely, you already have a family member who has stayed in or is currently living in a facility. So let's talk about the demographics here. In 2018, 39% of the nursing home residents were between the ages of 65 and 84. 15 were over 85 and the rest of them were younger adults with disabilities. Two thirds of those residents are women. Now this is primarily because women tend to live longer than men and while they're more likely to care for their spouses at home, there's nobody there to take care of them once their husbands have passed, so they're more likely to live out their years in a facility. All right, so you might be asking yourself, how in the world are 70% of our seniors gonna end up leading long needing long-term care? I had the same question actually, which is why I started doing this research. What I found is that for the most people, it's a lack of mobility. Over 80% of nursing home residents are not just there for medical reasons, they're actually there because they've lost the ability to physically take care of themselves. 77% need help bathing, 69% need help walking, 62% need help dressing, 49% going to the bathroom, 51% getting in and out of bed, and 26% need help eating. Two thirds of those residents actually need assistance with three or more of these things, which of course makes sense, right? If over half of them, 51%, need help getting in and out of bed, they also need help getting dressed and going to the bathroom and eating. Now, even though over 80% got there because they can't do for themselves, most of those residents unfortunately also suffer from various chronic medical conditions. Some people call those illnesses of old age. They're the same ones that happen to be six out of the top 10 causes of death in America, heart disease, cancer, diabetes, dementia or Alzheimer's, COPD and stroke. And unfortunately, because so many of the residents have had these chronic conditions, probably for a long time, and they fail to thrive in a long-term setting, they're not living very long once admitted, but we're gonna talk about that a little bit more in a minute. All right. So we've established why seven out of 10 of us will end up needing long-term care. Let's talk for a second about why you and I really want to avoid that. And then stick around because later we're going to actually talk about what you can do right now today to live a long and active life in your final years at home. 
Let's first talk about the dangers and negative consequences to living in a long-term facility. First of all, one to three million serious infections occur every year in facilities. Think bed sores, UTIs, MRSA, sepsis. In addition, over 56% of the residents end up in a hospital for care, many of those because of falls or fractures. Several studies from 2014 to 18 have shown that residents in long-term facilities are at a higher risk than those living at home of functional disability, decreased mobility, worsening physical function, cognitive decline, depression, anxiety, social isolation. Another study from 2004 actually compared people living in a nursing facility to those living in the community, and they found out that there was significantly more hopelessness or helplessness and depression among those living in the facilities. I mean, have you ever been in one? Other common problems are malnutrition, dehydration, and the overuse or misuse of meds. That misuse of meds, also called polypharmacy, is actually what caused a friend of ours to be hospitalized for two weeks for being in a, quote, altered mental state, really because she was given a drug that is known to cause dementia-like behavior in people over 70. She was 91. She wasn't even being checked or treated for dehydration or a UTI, both of which she had, and caused similar behavior. So I was there with her a couple times a day until her family could fly in and it was awful. It was horrible. It wasn't until the family threatened litigation that the staff finally stopped with the medical mill long enough to properly diagnose and treat her. So in addition to the physical and mental decline that most experience at nursing homes, one in five residents also report elder abuse in either nursing or assisted living facilities. And this has actually increased over the last few years because of staffing shortages. Again, that same friend who was in the hospital has also experienced some verbal abuse by her assisted living facility staff after a pelvic fracture. It prevented her from being able to get up and get around and take care of herself. This is inexcusable but 20% experience it, and that's assuming that all incidents are reported. Another reason to avoid the long-term care facility is because they're expensive. Facilities range from 148 a day at assisted living to 297 a day for private rooms at nursing facilities. Although Medicare and Medicaid will cover for the shorter stays, especially if they're for rehab after a hospital stay, but if somebody is gonna require long-term care at a facility, the majority of that cost is gonna fall on that individual or their family. Y'all, this can mean thousands of dollars a month in care for you or your family. Even if you've got money saved up, this usually means selling off your assets and exhausting all savings. Finally, you might wanna stay out of the long-term facility because you don't wanna die. One study actually showed the yearly mortality rate of nursing home patients is about 32%. That's a third turnover every year due to death. Most of them aren't along, around very long, even if they last that first year. The median survival rate was only 2.2 years. Sadly, most die of an acute onset of pneumonia and other lower respiratory tract infections because of, surprise, being institutionalized and sedentary. Well, hopefully I've shed a little bit of light on the dilemma that many of us will be facing over the next several years if we don't make some changes. You might be asking yourself, is there something that I can do to prolong, prolong my ability to stay at home or to avoid needing to be in a facility at all? I've actually spoken with several people who believe that that's just part of the aging process. It's one of those things we probably all will face if we live long enough, unless we're lucky. It's just not true. Hang with me for a few more minutes and I think you might be encouraged. We just reviewed the reasons that we might not, we might need long-term care, right? They included a lack of mobility, chronic health conditions, social isolation, and then the lack of having a qualified loving caregiver. If we can do something about the first three things, then maybe we won't need the caregiver, right? Or the long-term facility. So are you ready to learn more? Here we go. All right, let me start by giving you some examples of people who live very active and productive lives well into their 90s and 100s. I know, I know. <laughs> who the heck wants to live to be 100? Listen, you and I probably had that opinion because our experience has been that very few people live healthy lives much past their 70s, let alone into their 90s and over 100. Most of the people that we have had contact with that age were almost always bedridden or wheelchair bound just counting the days so they can go be with Jesus. Well, let me help you change your mindset a little bit. I want to help you make a paradigm shift regarding old age and what that can look like for you. 
I want to start by looking at the regions of the world with the oldest populations that were largely healthy and independent. Because I figured that they had to figure it out that maybe we can do what they did, right? All right, these people were actually living active lives well into their 90s and 100s, continuing to find purpose and value in each and every single day. About 20 years ago, a guy named Dan Butner, he's a writer for National Geographic, studied the five regions of the world with the most centenarians and coined them the Blue Zones. If you're a Zac Efron fan and you were stuck at home binging Netflix in 2020 like most of us, you've probably seen something about the Blue Zones in the first season of his show called Down to Earth. I think he covered it on Sardinia. All right, so back to Dan, Dan Butner. In his research, he found that all the people in these so-called Blue Zones had some things in common. They all ate whole food diets, rich in plants and legumes, beans, and tubers. Think potatoes and sweet potatoes. And they had not yet succumbed to the Western diet of highly processed foods with everything doused in sugar and fried oil. They walked almost everywhere they went. They had strong social networks. They spent time every day in some sort of prayer and meditation. And they all had relatives close by. These are not just habits they started at a retirement at age 65. This was a way of life for them. Now, four of those blue zones were in different countries, but one of them was right here in Loma Linda, California, home to a very large population of Seventh-day Adventists who have been studied quite a bit. While the numbers of healthy blue zone elders in those other countries has been declining a little bit over the last few generations because of the introduction of the Western diet, the Adventists have actually maintained their healthy habits, even living here in the U.S., mostly because their healthy habits are intertwined in their religious culture and they're not swayed by societal changes or mass advertising. So how about you? You might not live in a blue zone, but let's talk about how you and I can make a few shifts in our lives today that just might help keep us healthy at home tomorrow. First, staying connected to your purpose is a great way to insulate yourself against needing to live in a long-term facility. Once someone retires from a career, they often make the mistake of retiring from life. You have to have a reason to get up every morning, y'all. You have to have a cause or a passion, something that drives you forward every day. You need to find a passion project either in your community or within your family that's important. My dad actually did this. He retired from his career in insurance at 65, but he picked up painting as a hobby during the summer months when golfing in South Florida was just way too hot. Turns out he's really good. He became involved in the local artist community and he spearheaded a fundraising campaign that has actually made a lot of money for local public school art programs. And at 80 years old, he opened an artist studio and gallery where he and seven other artists paint and show their work. He's turning 82 this year and when we try to get together, it's his schedule that we have to work around. It's not even mine. Several other key behaviors that are paramount to staying out of a long-term facility and living independently all have to do with diet and lifestyle choices. Things that you can do today. Stop smoking. This is really non-negotiable. It's tied to higher risk of heart disease, stroke, cancer, COPD. There's so many free programs to help, guys. So if this is something that you're still doing, find a method that, stop, that works for you and stop. And that includes e-cigarettes. You want to reduce the alcohol intake. You don't have to be alcohol free, but save it for special occasions. Even though red wine has received some good press in the last few years for helping reduce heart disease, one to two drinks a day of any kind of alcohol increases a woman's risk, risk of breast cancer by 33%. The alcohol actually increases the risk of all cancers and the higher risk comes in with the higher intake. The more you drink, the higher the risk. You wanna slow down or stop the progression of chronic diseases through diet and lifestyle. For some, this sounds like it's just not possible. There are so many people that truly believe that part of getting older is having high blood pressure or heart disease or high cholesterol or having stents or getting diabetes and eventually maybe dementia. They think that if you live long enough, you're gonna experience some of these things. Again, that's not true. Even if you have a family history, I've actually researched this pretty extensively and written about it and the Blue Zones in my blog. So if you want to read more about that, you can find those posts on my website at kellyjomo.com. I'll also put a link below. You know, there's a saying that actually explains this very well. Genetics may load the gun, but lifestyle and diet pull the trigger. None of these diseases are predestined if you stay away from smoking, excessive alcohol, high fat, heavily processed and sugary foods. You need to add greens and fiber to your diet and reduce those other items and you just might 
have to get your doctor to reduce or stop some of your meds. I mean, wouldn't that be great? There's truly so much to unpack here on just this one topic alone. And hopefully I haven't lost any of you guys at this point because I know some of you don't believe that diet has any impact on your health. But let me just point out that every single one of us puts two to three pounds of food in our bodies every day. You have to understand that what you eat matters. It's what's fueling your body. There are actually dozens of studies that point to dietary choices as being key to improved health often not only stopping the progression of disease, but actually reversing it. Do you have a history of cancer in your family, heart disease, dementia, diabetes? If so, you really need to explore this more. There are so many good sources of information on this subject. You can also keep an eye out for more videos here on my channel because I'm gonna actually be sharing more information like this on a regular basis. What you learn, something here that might just change your life. That'd be pretty cool. So anyways, back to the topic today, which is staying at the nursing home. So far, we've covered having purpose, stopping smoking, reducing alcohol consumption, making dietary changes to slow and stop the progression of disease. Another critical piece to staying out of the nursing home is to strengthen your bones, maintain balance and mobility through, and I know this is a dirty word, exercise. Think about it, though. Since 80% of long-term facility patients got there due to mobility issues, Many of those started with broken bones. This is really critical. I'm not just talking about running marathons or doing CrossFit, okay? I'm talking about just daily low impact cardio, walking 20 minutes a day, maybe doing some strength training two to three times a week. I know lifting weights, really Kelly? But you have to stress your muscles in order to get those bones to be stressed and to regenerate and strengthen. Also, you want to work on your balance. If you don't want to take a, a class like yoga, Pilates, Tai Chi, those are all great. Then just do simple, something simple. Stand on one leg for several seconds and then switch to the other. Work up to maybe a minute on each leg. I don't, I don't know. Maybe while you're standing on one leg, bend over, come back up again. All of those things help with balance. And you guys, I know some 40-year-olds that cannot stand on one leg for a minute. So you really want to be able to work on that. Let me make one more point about exercise. Did you know that exercise helps reduce dementia risk. There's actually a part of your brain called the hippocampus, I know it's a funny name, that's in the area of the brain that is the key for maintaining memory. Studies actually show that this part of the brain is stimulated by the types of, types of exercise that increase your heart rate. So you wanna get out, you wanna sweat a little, you wanna get your heart rate up and improve your memory all at the same time. All right, so I think we're on number six now. Reduce inflammation through diet. Systemic inflammation is often caused by diet and can usually cause fatigue and joint pain, which will cause you to be even more inactive. But that's not all. It's also a key risk factor for diseases like cancer, heart disease, diabetes, asthma, just like we talked about a minute ago. This is actually where it all started for my husband. He couldn't walk to the neighbor's house without hurting, could barely get out of his car after an hour drive, and he was always tired. So after having his C-reactive protein levels checked, we found out that his cellular inflammation was off the charts. The level of inflammation in his body put him at a very high risk for stroke. Unfortunately, we caught it. We were able to make some changes before it was too late. We actually made some pretty hard, hardcore changes to the diet because we had to. And that reduced his CRP levels to less than what they, a half of what they had been in just three months, and then back down to normal levels within six months. He looked and felt better than he had in years. Something else that's interesting that you might wanna know is chronic inflammation is actually the primary cause for joint damage, not wear and tear like most people assume. Osteoarthritis, which is joint inflammation, is known as the leading cause of chronic disability in the U.S. Now, y'all remember that 80% of the nursing home residents got there because of mobility issues, right? The food choices that you make every single time you pick up a fork matter. Diet is going to directly increase or decrease the inflammation, which is going to affect your joints. Did you know that eating more fiber can actually lower your chance of osteoarthritis of the knee by over 60%? It could be just as easy as adding some plants to your plate since animal foods have no fiber. Gotta eat plants. All right, on to number seven. Avoid dehydration by drinking enough water. You know, I went to a uh, dermatologist once, I'm going to emphasize one time, who told me that water wasn't necessary for good skin and hydration. Whether we got our liquids from sodas or coffee or juice, as long as we got liquid, we'd be fine. Well, obviously I did not return to his office. And I got to be honest here, water's not my favorite drink. 
but I make sure to drink 64 ounces every single day because I know that it keeps me hydrated. That results in more energy and alertness. Man, can I tell when I haven't gotten enough. For people entering their older years, this is something that's even more important. Not having enough water will cause cystitis and UTIs as well as cause dementia-like uh, behavior. Additionally, water intake is directly associated with a lower risk of heart attacks. So one study specifically found that when five glasses a day are consumed over three glasses, the risk of heart attacks decreases significantly. All right, so here we are at number eight. Improving cognitive health and slowing mental decline is critical to living independently as we age. Of course, we wanna be able to get up and do for ourselves, right? This can be done through diet and exercise and involvement in something that requires critical thinking or creativity. And I don't mean just picking up a Rubik's Cube or doing those brain age exercises on your phone. There's so much here to unpack, way more than I can cover in this video. But understand that what we eat and our exercise level have a direct impact on the thickening of our arteries and veins. So vascular dementia, vascular meaning the veins, is a byproduct of the thickening of the lining of blood vessels and clots, just like most strokes and heart disease. What's really cool is that in addition to diet and exercise, intellectual stimulation can also help if you, helps you to avoid uh, dementia because that stimulation causes these connections to grow in your brain. So while studies show that although people with higher education usually remain sharp as they age, somebody with no formal secondary education can also increase their risk with cognitive exercises like cards, uh, crossword puzzles, reading. No doubt at all that the worst thing you could do is retire from life when you retire from your job. My dad kept busy with golf, weekly poker games, hanging out with his friends, and like I said, he took up painting in, in retirement. And he's definitely keeping his mind engaged. All right, so I think we're down to the last two right now. Number nine is sleep. Sleep is another ingredient to help you age well and stay alert. Some reasons are more obvious than others. I mean, when you're tired from a lack of sleep, you make errors in judgment while walking and driving, right? You also eat more junk food. You tend not to be as active. However, there's some real physiological reasons why getting enough sleep at night needs to be a priority for aging well. At night, when you sleep, is when your body regenerates cells, your cortisol levels, levels lower, and it also clears your body of amyloid. Now, amyloid is the stuff that becomes plaque on your brain, which leads to dementia. Another side effect of deficient sleep is being overweight, which, as you probably already know from COVID, is a risk factor for a whole bunch of other things like diabetes, cancer, heart disease, metabolic disease, flus, COVID, all of that. Finally, lastly, one of the keys to staying at healthy at home and avoiding the nursing home is to maintain strong social circles. And you wanna be involved in group activities. Now, for most of the Blue Zone residents, this involved extended family and religious groups. This is gonna sound crazy, but having a rich social life may actually be better for your overall health than quitting smoking. I know. A review of over 100 studies was done, and the conclusion was that a strong social network that included getting together and enjoying each other's company could reduce all-cause mortality by 50%. Now, don't get carried away with this and think that having a tight network of friends is going to protect you from lung cancer if you're a smoker. It doesn't quite work like that, okay? Unfortunately, many people find that their social circles naturally lessen as they age. People are no longer involved in their kids' activities, friends move away, they retire. It's difficult to maintain those social circles. All right, so there you have it. The life choices you can start making today that will keep you out of the nursing home. Let's review them. You want to maintain your sense of purpose. You want to quit smoking. Reduce alcohol in intake. Slow or stop the progression of chronic diseases through reducing the sugar and the heavily processed foods from your diet. Strengthen your bones and maintain balance. Reduce inflammation by reducing sugar and increasing fiber. Drink 64 ounces of water a day. Keep your mind engaged. Get a good night's sleep. And finally, maintain solid social circles. I know this has been a lot to digest. There are tens of thousands of us, though, in the next 10 to 15 years that will be reaching the age at which many are going to start needing care. You just learned about the issues with long-term facilities and what you can do to delay or avoid needing one, but can you really make those changes needed to change the trajectory of your health? 
It's really quite simple, and depending upon your lifestyle choices up to this point, it may not even be that difficult to do. Hopefully, if nothing else, you're willing to explore your options and maybe take on a few new habits. Keep an eye out over the next few weeks as we explore each of these 10 things that will help us avoid the nursing home, and I'm going to take a little deeper dive into each one. If you like any of what you've heard today, please do me a favor, hit that like button below and maybe subscribe so that these new videos will hit your feed as I post them. As I wrap up, I want you to remember this. Your future health is not predetermined. You are in control of how you live out today in your final years. Just make some small changes now and you can really transform your future. We can all genuinely feel good again. I know you can do it and I look forward to maybe playing a small part of that journey. Until next time, I encourage you to stay healthy and live centered. Be well.